Dear friends, uh, I will be talking with you module 13, Promoters, Their Positions, Powers, Duties and Liabilities. This presentations I am making under the supervision of Dr. Harpreet Kaur, the associate, the professor, National University Delhi. Uh, myself, Dr. Asis Kumar Srivastava. I am from Faculty of Law, University of Lucknow. I am LLM PhD. In this module, I will be dealing with the promoters, their positions, powers, liabilities and remunerations. While introducing the subject, the promoters, I must deal with the basic aspects of the promotions of the company. While promoting a company, a person uses the company as a legal device for Maximization of profit, which is basically known as the business or trading activities. So, promoters basically in a society are known as entrepreneurs who exercising their fundamental right to do business uses the corporate cover, the corporate companies for maximization of profit. The promotion is a very difficult task wherein the promoters while promoting the company travels through ranges of activities. Therein, he incorporates the company, manages the capital for the company, gives the necessary directions to the directors of the company. In this module, the learning outcome for you will be who is a promoter, what is promotion, what are the duties of promoters, what are the liabilities of promoters, what is the remuneration of promoters, and what is pre-incorporation agreement. Now we should switch to the first issue that is the promoters and promotions. As we know that promotion is a very technical and non-technical task wherein the promoters are engaging certain associates or aides to help them out while promoting a company. Promotion of company right from the Joint Stock Companies Act has been a very technical issue wherein the law recognizes certain individuals as an association of persons and then gives them the law, uh, corporate cover which they can exercise and use for maximization of profit. This promotion has been of three types individual promotion, institutional promotion and professional promotion. In individual promotions the people who are very much jealous and enthusiastic, they come together, they form a company and they run the company. In the institutional promotions, in order to pursue the objectives which are set by the people and the companies which are in public dealings, so therein the public companies can promote another company. And third category is professional promotions, wherein the companies corporate or incorporate a company and those companies the first business is incorporations and investments and mostly it is a west formula where the people give this assignment of promoting the company to the professional companies and we have certain companies like UBS, Merrill Lynch who promote the company on the professional basis and for that there are fair charges. Moving on we will come to the stages of promotion, what task a promoter is assigned to and how he moves on. So this starts with the conception of idea because I told you that this is a modus operandi of doing business and because it's a device of doing business then if you plan it better that what kind of corporate cover do you want, what kind of corporation do you want for your particular type of services and goods. then half the task is all done. So it starts with conception of idea. It moves to the next stage that is the most important stage that is called incorporation. And then next stage come which is called flotation wherein the promoters manage the capital of the company. And then the last stage comes which is called commencement of business. Moving on, we will now try to define the term promoters. I must make you clear that this last, last year 
In 2013, the new Company Act was passed by the Indian Parliament, uh, that is Companies Act 2013. In that, for the first time, we have tried to define the term promoters. Otherwise, the term promoter was not defined in the old Act. And there was a proper definition that was given by House of Lord in a judgment that is Welle Bridge Company versus Green, wherein Justice Bowell tried to conclude the term by saying that promotion is an activity where there is a culmination or the confluence of two activities, one is technical, the other is non-technical. And in technical aspects, he says, arranging the know-how, having a project planning, having a feasibility study, these are the technical aspects of promotions of the company. And in non-technical aspects of the company, which is basically the incorporation of the company, you have to have the required assemblage of the subscribers, you have to get documented the documents of the company, that is the memorandum and articles of the company, and you may have to draft the prospectus if you are going for the initial public offer or the other types of private placement. So essentially, if you see promotion, the promotion basically is founding a company. So it's just like a father giving birth to a baby. The next wonderful definition that we get is the definition which is there in the Security Exchange and Commission rule of US, which is equally a very important decision, sorry, def definition to know, wherein the rule defines the term promoter as a person who acting alone or in conjunction with other persons directly or indirectly takes the initiative in founding or organizing the business enterprise. It also very much emphasizes the term founding or organizing the business enterprise. So doing anything for founding the company for maximization of profit leads to the conclusion that that is the promoter. Now in the two 69 to subsection 69 of the Indian Companies Act has defined the term promoter because we have seen that the most of the companies now being used as a mode of scams or mode of what we call gotalas in Indian term. So in that there was a need, there was a dire need to define the term promoters and because of that we have defined it in section 2 subsection 69 which basically is Three, that any person whose name appears on the prospectus of the company or whose name appears in the annual return of the company is a promoter. Then any person who controls the affairs of the company directly or indirectly, then he is also a promoter of the company. And last, in accordance with whose device the directors are instructions of the board of directors of the company is accustomed to act. And this does not include the professional people who are engaged with the company, like lawyer, the company secretary, they are not included. So if you see this definition, the close analysis may be that promotion is a person, or sorry, promoter is a person whose name appears in the official documents of the company and promoter is a person who has a full control over the affairs of the company. Now we will move to the activities which a promoter does while promoting the company. So if you see the activities of promoters, it ranges from the so many activities like when he starts for having the idea of the company, the most important things comes to the mind that he wants to do business by buying and selling and buying and selling goods and services. So he has to see what can be sold first of all. So feasibility survey that what can be sellable and what, what is in demand, that is the first task that has to be done. And then the second task is that how you can better sell that thing, by which company, because we know we have different types of companies now, we have OPC, one person company, we have a small company also, we have producers company, we have service company, we have so many companies. So depending upon what you want to sell, a suitable type of corporate device can be picked and choose. So that is the first thing which we know that conception of idea. And when you conceptualize the idea, conceive a baby, that what kind of baby or what kind of company you are, want to have, then the features. And for those features, you need to have so many things to be done in a while. Like 
you shall have to apply for so many numbers now that is the same number corporate identity number then gln number global location number tan and pan number as we know because they are subject to the tax realization then the next requirement is that you need to have the required number of subscribers because as we know that we need two or seven subscribers for making public and private companies so you have to have those required number of subscribers you have to have the numbers which are very much required by the ministry of corporate of affairs now and then moving on you have to go for the next important aspect that is incorporation of company wherein you shall have to apply to the roc with required documents and fees plus you have to have the documents of the company that is articles and memorandum they are the most important thing in the life of the company then you have to have a very bulky document which is prospectus in the prospectus because by the prospectus you invite people to come and invest by share in the company so you have to have a uh, draft prospectus also after that you have to have so many intermediaries the bankers the registrar the depository participant the depositories the custodian and they will be involved in the process of share subscription which we know as flotation and therein the issuer investors and intermediaries will arrange capital for the company and after that or within the process of that the promoters also will be doing so many vetting and compliance activities while drafting the prospectus or arranging the capital by way of ipo or private placement and in all these activities he is doing all such activities for the company which is non existence because as we know that company comes into an existence forthwith after the getting certificate of incorporation so so long the certificate of incorporation is not there there is no birth of the company and for that for each thing that is to be done for founding an enterprise the promoter is responsible and for that he enters into an agreement that is known as pre incorporation act agreement and these pre incorporation agreement can be used by the promoters for getting everything the technical know how for the business the employment of the workforce getting a land for the business enterprise getting a land for the headquarter of the business enterprise getting a land for the manufacturing unit of the business enterprise signing so many a number of agreements with the supplier with the trader with the warehouse keepers so in all these you have to use the pre incorporation agreement moving on we will now try to find out what is the legal position of the promoters as we know that the indian companies act 2013 does not define the role actually of the promoters but promoters are in a very better positions in regard to the information and access to the material and confidential information about the formation process of the company that's why sometimes they are known as agents and sometimes they are known as trustee but in a very important case which was erlanger versus new sombrero phosphate company limited the creance lord justice defined that the promoters undoubtedly stand in a fiduciary capacity or fiduciary positions the term fiduciary as defined by different law lexicon means that where the people are having mutual trust and faith now moving to the duties of promoters so as i told you that promoters has a fiduciary role to play in the company in for formation process and that specifically leaves two duties are that casts two duties on the promoters the first is duty not to make secret profit the second is duty to disclose so duty not to make secret profit basically is casted upon the promoters because the promotion may be a sentimental attachment or may be a matter of sentiment and promotion may be also misused and we have seen so many cases where the corporate veil have been abused so where the corporate veil is being abused by fraudulent people in order to wash off the properties are in order to dump their unproductive uh, properties be it tangible or intangible in the companies then they can make secret profit and where they are making secret profit 
without disclosing, then they will be bound to return it, bound to restore it with the company. And I would like to share why this situation arises in the company formation process. Because in company formation process, the promoters are in the positions who are knowing everything about formation. And they also know what objectives they want to achieve by making that company. And this gives a very better understanding about the position, actual positions and the informations regarding the pricings of the things. And there they can make an attempt to dump their third rated products with the company on a very high price. And we have very fine example of cases like Gluckstein versus Barnes where the promoters tried to dump their product which was known as Olympia and they tried to make 20,000 pound secret profit which was actually restored back to the company. And then there is a very fine case which I cited before also Erlanger versus New Sombrero Phosphate Company where the promoters tried to have make profit out of exhausted mines which actually costed the 5,000 pound for 1 lakh 10,000 pound without disclosing to the company. So these examples, these illustrations show how promoters having better access to the informations and having a better position in the company regarding to the pre-incorporation agreement can misuse their positions by making profit. I must make you clear at this moment that making profit is not disallowed. You can make profit provided you disclose it to the company. Then the second duty out of the fiduciary capacity of the promoters that is duty to disclose interest in the transaction. This duty again is based upon the principle of natural justice that the persons who are dealing with the corporate affairs of the company, they must be very much meticulous, very bona fide and they should disclose everything about everything which they are knowing about any product. So, if these duties are not performed by the promoters, then the company can resign the contract and the company can also suit for recovery of profit. But the company shall have to prove that actually the promoter was in a position where he can have a better access and where he has actually misused his authority by not disclosing that fact, material fact to the company or by making a secret profit. So if he is making a secret profit, then he shall have to restore it back. And in order to check it out whether he has made any secret profit or not, the first AGM is dedicated just to investigate and examine wow and what were the root of promotions and what kind of promotional activities have been initiated by the promoters while promoting the company and actually the promoters made any profit or not. So by these illustrations we can see that promoters are under a moral obligations to promote the company in the best effort or in the best suitable manner. Moving on, we will be now dealing with a very small aspect of the duties that when this duty starts and when this duty terminates. So the duty starts with the conception of idea. The moment the people, the entrepreneurs who want to do business by way of corporations for maximization of profit conceive the idea that we have to do business by the corporation, this duty starts immediately. And the duty basically does not terminate in a sense because so long the company will be running, the promoters will like to have a better grip over the company because this is their baby. And when they have promoted the company, they will like to have their control over the affairs of the company. That's why they use the controlling shares which we now have ED, EDVR, equity with differential voting rights, where they will have lesser amount of equity, but that would give them a better control in the corporate affairs of the company. So actually speaking, their duty never dies. Their duty continues. But so far so, duty regarding the promoter's liability is concerned, then the promoter's duty terminates at the moment when the first directors are appointed. And if no directors are appointed, the same promoter become the deemed director of the company. That's why if directors are appointed, their duty terminates. If directors are not appointed, their duty continues, but in a different role as a director of the company. Moving on, we will now switch over to the next issue that is liabilities of promoters. As I told you that this year we have made this act very comprehensive, where we have tried to plug the loopholes which were earlier there in the old act. 
that's why we find at so many place mentioned the liabilities of promoters and those liabilities are civil as well as criminal and these are result of the recent scams that took place in the corporate affairs as we know these were satyam and ron like scandal and because of that we made the provisions of the companies act more comprehensive more covering and more reaching in terms of unscrupulous promotions and we have two terms in the companies act which is very much pivotal that is officer who is the officer of the company and officer in default and the officer in default is punished for every type of wrong decisions that is being taken for every type of wrong compliance of the corporate laws which is there in the companies act so we now see that the term officer and officer in default is very comprehensive enough to cover the promoters so if we see the liabilities of the promoters it starts as i told you from the conception of the ideas to the incorporation then the flotation then it goes for the commencement of business and lastly if the companies promoters continues to control their power or want to have a controlling power over the company it continues till the death of the company that is the winding of the company now the companies act is a very pivotal in regard to the making of the company so if someone is furnishing wrong information thereby getting the company incorporated that is punishable in section 7 of the new act and there is liability of the promoters as an officer in default for making a misstatement in the prospectus and this liability is civil as well as criminal and promoters are also liable for inducing people for buying shares in a corporations and then promoters are equally liable for making periodic disclosures which are meant for bringing transparency and accountability of the corporations and they are the annual return and the annual financial statement which is very important to be filed under section 92 of this act as i told you that the company is required to appoint first director usually they are appointed by the articles of the company but if company fails to appoint them then the same promoters will become deemed directors so here also the role changes but the liability doesn't there will they will be liable in a different role then the promoters also play very pivotal role in the corporate combination process that is merger and acquisition and amalgamations and therein they can avoid the hostile takeover by either buyback system or by some other system so in a corporate combination process they also play very control link role because they have controlling shares in the company and those controlling shares can be offloaded or unloaded depending upon the situation they are in if they want to have it they can offload it if they do not want to have it they can buy more securities from the market that is buyback moving on the liability is also continued when they are in the process of winding up as we know that winding up of the company is termination of the death and therein if there is winding up continues the promoters are not dispensed with the liabilities that is there they will be under liable to cooperate fully with the company liquidator with the company bench if that is there which is monitoring the winding up process and now we have very comprehensive criminal as well as civil liabilities of the promoters if in during winding up process they are misusing their authority and they are promoting the fraudulent activities then they shall be liable under section 336 to 342 of the new companies act as well as they will be also liable from section 447 to 453 act uh, 453 of the act wherein they are made liable in a very comprehensive manner for all such fraudulent activities which turns out to be fraudulent after the winding up of the company and there is one very specific provision section 450 which is very comprehensive and which is of residuary nature you can further refer the bear act of the companies act for your inclusive growth now moving on uh, i will now concentrate about the very important aspect of the promotion that is the prospectus as we know that the prospectus is of a document by which you make people aware that this is the company and there you can invest and 
in the prospectus you see that company provides three basic information one is the general information of the company what the company is what the company is doing what the company is going to do then there is financial information of the company basically it is a balance sheet or p and l account of the last three preceding financial years and then the issue information that what kind of ipo you want to bring in initial public offer and by that what is your target to achieve what is your subscribed capital what is your paid up capital what would be your paid up capital and by that paid up capital how you are going to realize your objectives so in the issue part you have to provide so many things like you have to provide the base price you have to provide for the book building process you have to provide for the uh, qibs who will be the qibs who will be the institutional investors who will be the retail investors and who is your stock exchange whether you are listed or not, not listed so many things you have to provide but the basic important feature of the ipo process is prospectus as we know that drafting a prospectus is very technical task that is assigned to the company and that is more than 500 pages document which is running so wherein you have to provide everything the general information financial information and issue information so you take help from outside and the help is provided by the sebi security exchange board of india because sebi is the regulator of the capital market the primary and secondary so sebi will be helping you out and therein first you have to draft a prospectus and file with the sebi after drafting the prospectus the sebi will uh, do the red pencil exercise that is known as red herring prospectus and finally there will be final publication of a draft after the final publication of the draft people will buy the shares of the company so we see that the role of prospectus is very important in the share subscription because it helps the prospective investors of the company to make up a decision rational decision whether they should invest in the company or not and whether by disclosures made in the prospectus the company appears to be a company which is actually going to achieve certain objectives which are moral also not only the legal because legally speaking the company is meant for maximization of profit but maximization of profit cannot be an objective of any society it is also associated with all other objectives like tax like employment like supply of necessities so one has to be closely uh, seeing all these aspects also he cannot ignore it moving on uh, i am dealing with the prospectus prospectus is very important and as i told you that for drafting a prospectus which is not meticulous you may have to have civil and criminal liability and for that i would like to quote a case which can make you better understand the prospectus and misstatement in the prospectus that is a very old case william H dairy versus henry peak dairy versus peak we know it often and this case is about how misstatement in the prospectus is a very material one and in this case there was a company british tramways companies british tramways companies applied for license with the board of trade and this license was pending but the directors assuming that they in all probable cases will get the license they made a disclosure in the prospectus that they have got the license from the board of trade and they will now run the british tramways company instead of horse power with the steam power but actually the situation was that the license application was pending with the board of trade so actually they did not receive so the information that was with them was not true but they believed it to be true and they made it and on certain grounds the house of lord held it that this is a case of misrepresentation not fraud that's why the directors were not held accountable but this case is a very fine example upon which we drafted our companies act and therein we provided for civil as well as criminal liability of the promoters in case there is any misleading or misstatement in the prospectus so in this regard i would like to say that while drafting the prospectus we observe the golden rule formula and golden rule formula is make 100% disclosure about the facts which are within the information of the promoters so as to make no the prospective investors of the company the best about the company moving on as we know that i was telling you that there are provision in the companies act new companies act in section 34 and 35 which is civil and criminal liability regarding the misstatement of prospectus but there are general 
general and special defenses also available to the people who are associated with the prospectors. If they have withdrew their consent, they will not be held accountable. If they are working in professional capacity, they will not be held accountable. If something is creeping in, in the prospectors without their information, they will not be held accountable. So this is about the special aspect of liability with regard to the prospectors especially. Moving on, the next issue which we will be dealing is very crucial one is pre-incorporation agreement. The term pre-incorporation agreement as I suggested you is very important because these are the soul and heart of the company formation process. As I told you that here the corporation that is a contemplation in the eye of law that is a legal device that is a legal person speaking so that is a corporation aggregate also. So in this corporation aggregate we find that certain individuals are given a corporate cover and they are held as a different individual or different personality that is a corporate personality and corporate personality is altogether different from the other members who are actually the subscribers of the company. So the actual position is that they are doing the thing for a company which is going to come in future. So whatever acts they are doing now that will be validated only when the company gets incorporated. Meaning thereby whatever agreements they have to sign in order to mobilize the resources for formation of the company that has to be done in some representative character wherein they are disclosing that whatever material whatever resources they are getting that would be utilized for the formation of the company. Meaning thereby whatever agreement they are signing that should be signed on account of or on behalf of a company which is going to come in future. So this agreement which basically is very pivotal in company formation process is known as pre-incorporation agreement. But the legal issue with the pre-incorporation agreement is that those agreements are signed by the company which is not in existence and those agreements will be nullity in the eye of law as explained in a case Kellner versus Baxter and that Kellner versus Baxter case is a fine example about the crucial issue that was involved in the pre-incorporation agreement wherein two people Kellner and Baxter they incorporated a company promoted a company Graves and Royal Alexandra Hotel Company and therein the one person one party tried to sell the wine to the other party the price was 900 pound and this was done by a sale agreement which was signed on January 27, 1866 when the company was not incorporated. The directors, the would-be directors of the company ratified the agreement on February 1st, 1866. Even now the company is not incorporated. Then it was finally, uh, the company finally received a certificate of incorporation on 20th February. And subsequently also directors signed a ratification agreement on 11th April. So we see that there is a sale happening of wine which will be used for business by the company which is going to come. And the sale agreement is actually taking place much before the date of incorporation. And date of incorporation is very important in this regard because after that only the legal existence of the company will come. So in this case the court held that until the company is incorporated it cannot contract and because it cannot contract then the effect of contract will be nullity because the company was not there being an honest. There was no existence of the company. That's why pre-incorporation agreement will not be valid. And all those things which are being mobilized, the liability for that will be held or liability for that will be borne by the promoters. So because of this technical issue regarding the pre-incorporation agreement, there was a kind of repelling factor which stops the promoters promoting a company because they may be in a situation that company may avoid all those agreements subsequently to the incorporation process because as I told you in the first AGM, the promoters are made accountable that whatever pre-incorporation agreements they have signed that would be checked and verified. That's why the Jenkins committee in 1962 in England recommended for that we should have a provision for the protection of the promoters and therein by the recommendations of Jenkins committee there was an amendment made in the English Companies Act 1985 under section 36 wherein the promoters were given a relief and the relief was that if the pre-incorporation agreements 
is warranted by the terms of incorporations, then the company cannot repudiate its liability, the company cannot reject all those agreements. And then in the line of that, we are also a common law country, we also had an amendment in our act and the amendment was made in the Indian Specific Relief Act 1963 in the provision 15H and 19E. In both situations, if there are pre-incorporation agreements, then in pre-incorporation agreements, they can be made enforceable by company or against company if the activity which is the part or subject matter of the pre-incorporation agreement is warranted by the terms of incorporation. Warranted by the terms of incorporation is a very wide term. That basically means that whatever thing, whatever services, whatever activities has been done in the name of pre-incorporation agreement that is within the term of incorporation or not depends upon the situations. Like as I told you that if a company is being formed then promoters may have so many other opportunities. But if those opportunities are being availed by the promoters for their vested interest, then the company can obviously avoid it, holding it ultra virus, meaning thereby that was not warranted by the terms of incorporations. Like having a holiday while promoting a company when he is going to sign a technical or technology transfer agreement with some other country can be a situations which will be not warranted by the terms of incorporation. So this is the situations regarding the pre-incorporation agreement. Now moving on, we will be now dealing with the last aspect of the promotion activity that is the remuneration of the promoter. As we know that promoter stands in a fiduciary capacity where he is believed to have mutual trust and obligations and moral obligations for promoting the company. So naturally, the promoters are not given any kind of remuneration for promoting a company. As I told you that promoters basically give birth to a company and father does not charge anything from his baby. That is the basic quote that we have from the Robert R. Pennington's book. And But we see that because the promotion is a very technical task, it involves so many activities to be done. That's why the promoters are required to be paid something which have some monetary value in IF law. So promoters can be paid by fully paid up shares as was done in Solomon case. Promotion can also be given commission on shares sold. Promoters can also be paid a lump sum amount also. And the articles of the company may also provide for the promotional remunerations. Apart from that, after the incorporation process, there can be a separate covenant or there can be a separate agreement with the promoters for the payment of the remuneration. So while remunerating the promoters, the company should also be mindful that promotion is not a very simple task. And if the promoters are in anticipation or in apprehension that they shall be paid for their promotions, they will not be ending up doing scams, they will not be ending up making secret profit, they will not be concealing very material information from the company. So remunerating the company is a very important thing while formation of the company. And in this regard, I would like to say that if the company is being sold a property which actually is of the promoter, then the company can in lieu of that assign him the fully paid up shares, which is the best mode of payment or most mode of remunerating the promoters. Moving on, as we have seen that in the promotion activities that the promoters are very important persons in the corporate affairs of the company, so they have a very better control over the management of the company and they keep this control throughout the life of the company. And the promoters are also the persons who actually sink and swim with the corporate life. Now I would like to close the module which I was talking with you on the promotions and I would like to say that promotion is very important activities wherein a promoter is involved in making a business enterprise 
which shall be used for maximization of profit. Thank you.